let's give it up for some new MCs. Those guys are killing it. I love these guys. They are fantastic. Hey, this is a brand new series for us. We've been praying about this series for a long, long time. We've been preparing for it for a while and just asking God to speak to us in a unique way. And I want you guys to know before we even start this series, there have been uh, loads and loads of people that have been praying for you by name. They've been praying for the people that were going to be here for this series. They've been praying for the folks who were going to uh, be joining us. Uh, and some of you guys are here for the first time. I don't believe that that's an accident. I don't believe that uh, God surprised you here. I'm not surprised you're here. Uh, so uh, we want to ask God as a group to bless this message and to just give us ears to hear, uh, to bless the series. We're going to be in here about four weeks on this topic. So let's do this. If you guys would, we don't normally do this, but if you would stand with me, stand up. That's okay. You're like, we don't stand until we stand during worship and we stand at the end. No, we're, I want you guys to stand up and bow your heads with me and pray with me. And, and you're like, some of you are like, I'm not a believer. I don't know what I'm doing here. We're just going to pray and you can be quiet. That's right. Uh, so pray with me. Dear God, we ask you to bless this series. We ask you to give us ears to hear. Father, we ask you to uh, soften our hearts. Lord, we're listening to you. Speak to us. God, we give you our hearts and our minds. Lord, help us to pay attention. And Lord, whatever it is that you lay on our hearts, Lord, I pray that we would be obedient to go and follow your will in that area. In your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. Hey, I got to ask somebody a favor. Would somebody mind getting me a music stand or something to put my Bible down, something to put my notes on? Uh, somebody want to jump? Clint, you are the man. Let's give my man Clint a hand. He's the dude. He's the best of the best. Hey, uh, we're, we're going through a series that uh, is called Builders, and we're going to study this particular area because we're going to study a man in the Old Testament. His name is Nehemiah. Say Nehemiah. Nehemiah. His name is Nehemiah, and Nehemiah, it was such a fascinating person. It's such a fascinating book because you don't see any, like, huge miracles in this book. I mean, like, there are miracles, but there's not, like, uh, the Red Sea getting split. There's not, like, all these other things. You are a gem. You are just the sweetest. Thank you so much. You're the best. Yeah, one more time. This thing, doesn't, this thing does not want to cooperate. There we go. Uh, this is just such a cool passage of Scripture because we don't see, like, Nehemiah is an ordinary guy. Nehemiah is a normal guy. There's nothing special about him. He wasn't prom king. He wasn't a CEO. He wasn't a president of anything. He wasn't really all that important. He didn't go to the best college. He wasn't captain of the football team. He wasn't a king. He, don't, he definitely wasn't a pastor or anything like that. But we see this ordinary guy named Nehemiah start out to build something for God. That's why we're calling it Builders. And do this incredible work for God. And, and God blesses it in such an enormous way. And it's beautiful. But I really feel like this book that we're going to look at is kind of like the blueprints for a move of God. It's kind of like the formula for the move of God. Now, God does his, is going to move in his own way, but basically what we learn as we look at this is that God can use any kind of ordinary people if they will honor him, if they'll spend time in prayer, if they'll go about it in a certain way. Uh, we don't want to just sit here and go, well, we, God, uh, we, we, pray that, we pray that you'll bless us. We want to ask God, what are the things that we can do that you can reward? What are the, the things, God, that you can do that uh, we can do that you can bless? Uh, I believe that there's a lot of potential in this room. I believe there's a lot of collective potential. See what I did there? Collective potential. I think there's a lot of collective pot potential in the room. I think there are future builders here. I think there's future CEOs in the room. I think there are people that you're like, there's nothing special about me. Yes, there is, and it's the God that lives in you. I think God is calling us to an enormous task. I think God has been putting Gainesville and our public schools on my heart in a, in a fresh way over these last couple of weeks and months, and as we've been preparing for this, I just feel the Holy Spirit moving in a unique way, and I'm talking about some things that uh, if you go to church a lot, you're like, yeah, I get what you're saying, but maybe you're here tonight and you're not a believer. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, there's a place for you here, and uh, th the message is going to apply to you just maybe in a little bit different way tonight than maybe for somebody who's been here for 10 years or 15 years or something along those lines. Um, but uh, I've just been asking God to bless this series, and we've had a whole team praying for you guys, so I'm looking forward to it. Uh, go ahead and turn to Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. 
Uh, now, you might have already noticed this. You've been, wait, is it, aren't we going through Nehemiah on Sunday mornings as well? Yes, Pastor David, and if you go to our Southwest campus, Pastor Jordan are, are taking us through the book of Nehemiah as well. So you are going to be an expert on the book of Nehemiah by the time we get a couple of weeks into this, a couple of months. We're going to be looking at some of the same passages, some different passages, and sometimes we'll look at the same passage, but we're going to look at it from a kind of a different angle, and it'll apply to us in a little bit different way. Um, but I want us to think a little bit about the situation that's happening here. So we're going to start right in verse 1. Verse 1, it says this. And if, if, if you have your Bible, then great. But if not, we've got it on the screen behind you. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakali. So most of this book is actually Nehemiah writing it himself. He's like, I'm the main subject, and I'm recording what happened. He says, now it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was, I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had uh, survived the exile, and uh, concerning Jerusalem. So he's like, hey, how are things going in Jerusalem? How are things going? And you might be wondering, why does he want to know what's going on in Jerusalem? Well, you got to really understand all that has been happening because we jump in at a small part of the Bible and we don't get the big picture. So let's like catch up on about 140 years real quick. Can we do that? Say, yeah. We can catch up really, really quick. That's all right. It'll take like half a second. About 140 years ago, before Nehemiah starts writing this, before the events of Nehemiah happen, uh, decades and decades before, the Israelites disobeyed God. God had given them a, a, a path to follow, laws to obey, and a way to live, and they had disobeyed God. So God judged them, he punished them, and he let a foreign power come in and literally wipe them out. You're like, God wouldn't do that. Yes, he did. He actually did it a couple of times because they didn't learn their lesson. But in this particular occasion, this group comes in and they wipe out the Israelites. The Jerusalem, the central place of worship and where the kingdom was started, it was just obliterated. The walls were knocked down. It says the gates were burned. The temple was destroyed. Literally everything there was to know about Jerusalem was in rubble. It was destroyed. And so for decades and decades, these people are now, they're slaves to the Babylonians. They moved in with these people, and they're, they're, they're house servants. They're working in the fields. They're doing all these jobs, but they're, they've lost who they are. They're demoralized. They're depressed. They're discouraged. They are just grief-stricken. It is a terrible time to be an Israelite. Now, Nehemiah has a particular job that is a little bit on the up and up. He's got a better job than pretty much everybody else. Nehemiah was the cupbearer. Anybody ever heard of this? You know what a cupbearer does? Naomi, what does a cupbearer do? Tell everybody real loud. Right. Who wants that job? Who wants to taste the drink that the king is going to get to make sure it's not poison? This was really, really common in that time and day, and it was actually still common in some parts of the world today that people would try to overthrow a kingdom or they'd try to overthrow a nation or a government, and the way they do that, well, let's take out the king. Let's poison his drink. It's classic. You've read a million books. You've heard stories about this. So Nehemiah was the guy to make sure he would take a sip. I'm not dead. You can have at it, king. That was his job. That was kind of a bougie job. That was a nice job. That was a job that a lot of people would want. They're like, yeah, I get to eat the king's food and, uh, you know, drink the king's wine and, like, get after it and have a good time. King liked the party, so Nehemiah was hanging out at a lot of parties. And you're like, they didn't part church people don't party. Well, Nehemiah was at parties. I don't know if he was necessarily participating, but he was there. And so he was probably, like, the kind of guy who was, like, taking selfies in his place. And he's like, guys, I'm up here with the king. We're having a good old time. I know you're jealous. Maybe not. Maybe not. But that's who Nehemiah was. He was a cupbearer. And it says that when these people show up in verse 1 and 2, that he asks about Jerusalem. He's like, somebody tell me about Jerusalem. What is happening? How is, are things going in Jerusalem? And, and he's asking this because those are his people. Those are, uh, that's his family. That's the, 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 the Israelites. That's his heritage. That's what he wants to know about. But it didn't look good in Jerusalem. They come back. In, in verse 3, they said to me, um, well, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. They're in this situation where everything seems hopeless. They're in this situation where there seems like there's no silver lining 
They're going to be slaves, and they're always going to be slaves, and they're never going to get to go home, and their home is always going to be destroyed, and it's in rubble, and it's in fire, and that's the way that it's always going to be. That's all they had to look forward to. There was no hope whatsoever. Listen, I'm looking forward to this series. I've been looking forward to this series because I know that there's a lot of people in the room tonight. There's a point in your life where you thought, it's hopeless. I have no hope. I have nothing to look forward to. There's no silver lining. Maybe this is you tonight. You have thought, my parents are always going to fight. Maybe you thought, I'm always going to struggle with this eating disorder. I'm never going to have any friends. I'm never going to get into that college. I'm never going to get onto that team. I'm never going to, I'm never going to, I'm always going to struggle with this sin addiction. I'm always going to be a slave to it. It's always going to own me, and I'm never going to get past it. It's always just going to have that stamp on me, and I'm always going to be addicted to this substance or that sin issue. You felt hopeless. The reason that I'm excited about this passage is because we will see that nothing is hopeless with our God. Would somebody say amen, please? Nothing's impossible with our God because he can transform a situation. He can turn around a situation faster than you can blink your eye. He can transform cities. He can change lives. He can make the dead come back to life literally and spiritually. Our God is the God that uh, hopeless doesn't mean anything to our God. And we're going to see that right here in this passage of Scripture. They've been struggling and struggling for decades. And actually, when he says right here, he says, uh, uh, tell me about the remnant. Tell me about the people. And actually, the, Hananiah and the people who answer him, they said, well, the people who escaped, those who have escaped exile, they've escaped this shame. Uh, those are people that went back to uh, Jerusalem a long time before Nehemiah ever would, before they had this conversation. They've been here a couple of decades, and they're still making no progress. And so... Nehemiah is going to get this bright idea, well, I feel like I ought to do something about it. We're studying this book because an ordinary guy, nothing special about him, with no pedigree, with no degree, with no qualifications, with no big job or any office in government or the church, said, I see a need, and I can't stand by and do nothing. Guys, there is a great need in this city. There's a great need in your high school and in your middle school, and I need some ordinary people. If you're talented, praise the Lord, that's good, but I just need some ordinary people who will say, we got to do something about it. Read with me verse 4. We're going to kind of cover the whole thing, and then we're going to move backwards. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I drafted a plan. I drew up my strategy. I, I recruited a bunch of volunteers. No, he doesn't say anything like that. He says, as soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I cried. I wept and I mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Listen, how many of you guys, just raise your hands, you don't cry. By show of hands, you're like, I don't really cry. I don't really cry. Really? Really? This was me up until about a year ago. I, up until about a year ago, I was like, I don't really cry. Uh, my dad's perfectly fine now, but uh, several years back when I was in high school, my dad got a form of cancer, and, and ever the whole family was like, no, this is terrible news. They gathered us in the living room, and they were talking, and my mom's crying, and my sister's crying, my brother's crying, dad's crying, and Zach is not crying. And hear me out. I'm worried what other people are going to start thinking at this point. I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I'm sad. I'm definitely, I'm totally sad. I don't want my dad to have cancer. I'm worried about what's going to happen, but I'm not crying. What's the deal? My parents probably think I don't love them. My dad probably thinks I don't care about them. Are you guys here feeling where I'm going with this? I was like, they think I'm a monster. I was like, they think I don't even love my dad. I could not cry. I didn't cry ever, ever. How many of you guys, uh, you are this person or you're sitting next to this person, they cry about everything? By round of applause, you cry about, you cry about a lot. It's okay. Don't be ashamed. Josh made everybody cry last week. Josh made everybody cry last week with that speech for Asa. Uh, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So up until about a year ago, I didn't cry. Like a year or so ago, all of a sudden, I'm getting emotional. I'm watching like chick flicks and going, oh, that is so touching. He knew her favorite ice cream. I'm getting like emotional. I'm like, what is wrong with me? Come on. 
I, I, get, I, I wish I would only cry, but like when it really matters, you know, somebody passes away or somebody's in serious danger. But no, I'm like getting all emotional about, that was so beautiful. Oh my goodness. And now uh, this is the situation that Nehemiah is in, right? Nehemiah is in this situation where it all seems hopeless, where everything seems like there is no silver lining, there is no positive end to this story. A lot of people would have said, probably, it's probably the way it's always going to be. I mean, they've been there for decades, right? They've been trying to rebuild for decades. They've been doing their very best. They've been trying to do everything that they can to rebuild the walls, to rebuild the cities. Uh, they do have the temple up, but they're still vulnerable. There's a couple of reasons I want us to focus in on why Nehemiah is broken, why he is just broken hearted here. It's, I, I don't want you to miss this. Nehemiah is broken hearted because he sees the defenselessness and the uselessness of his people. Nehemiah knows that without those walls, without those, look here in verse 3 again, it says, the, uh, the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed with fire. We're actually not sure when that happened. We know that way back, decades and decades before, that they came in and they obliterated the whole place. But during these last couple of decades, while they're trying to rebuild, it kind of seems like there have been their enemies, like the Ammonites and all these other ites and all these other nations that are trying to come in here and knock down what they're doing. So there's a lot of people that read this, a lot of scholars that read this and go, so they were trying to rebuild, and then it got knocked down, and then there's people who were like, no, 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 these are the same walls that were knocked down like 140 years ago, give or take. We don't know. But Nehemiah is brokenhearted because he knows that his people are defenseless from all of the attacks that are coming at them. And he knows on top of that that the people of Israel were called to be a light to the world. God said, I'm going to make you a great light to the world, and I'm going to put my, my glory on display like they were the OG missionaries. They were the first ones to be able to represent God. And Nehemiah knew without their home base protected, they were useless. They had nowhere to go. They were useless. So Nehemiah is, is broken because of this. But I think a lot of times it would be easier for us to stop and think, well, Nehemiah, you're not doing so bad. you got a pretty good job. You're kind of up there in, literally, he's at the king's vacation home when this news comes to him. He's at the foot of the mountains. He's chilling out. He's having a great time. Weather's probably beautiful. He's sure some of his food might be poison, but I mean, he's getting the best food. And it says later on in chapter two that they're having a party and they're having parties all the time. Like this was, it would have been so easy for Nehemiah to go, yeah, that really stinks, guys. Not my problem, though. Not my issue. Listen, I want you to realize this. It's easy when you're blessed to turn a blind eye to those that are not. A lot of you guys have grown up incredibly blessed in a, in a city that's not so bad, in a house that's not so bad, that parent, with parents that love you and take care of you, and you're here at church, we're, we're trying our best to love you and take care of you. By most people's standards, I don't know everybody's story, but I know by most people's standards, people are, we're blessed. Like God has given us so much more, and it's easy for us to just turn our blind eye and you go, yeah, but that's somebody else's problem. That's not for me to worry about. I want us to look here in verse 2 again and kind of break it down little by little. This part where, where Hanani, and he says, one of my brothers, we don't know if that's literally his brother or like an Israelite who's like, that, you know, that's, that's like my bro, sh he shows up and, and he asks him, he says, what's going on in Jerusalem? But he, uh, my translation says this, I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped. I, I inquired those are the ways that most of your Bible would translate it. But when you look at the word that he used when he wrote it in the original language, it literally means like he grabbed him by the collar and was like, tell me about Jerusalem. Somebody tell me. I'm dying to know. I've got to know. This is breaking my heart. It is keeping me up at night. I got to know. I got to know. I got to know. How are things going in Jerusalem? How are my people? He might have had family there. Have you seen my dad? Have you seen my parents? Have you seen my brother? Are they, are they okay? I've heard that there's attacks coming. What's going on? What's going on? It says he inquired. We could just breeze over that. But I want us to realize the burden that he had for Jerusalem, for his people. This ordinary guy with a burden, with a broken heart, with a conviction who says, I, I, I see a problem. I got to do something about it. This is just the beginning of his story. And we're going to be up here for, like I said, four weeks. But what we're seeing right now 
is the beginning of a move of God, and it starts with a burden. Before God can use any of us, he's got to break your heart. Before God can use any of us to do anything here in Gainesville, he's got to make you care about it. He's got to make you lose some sleep about it. He's got to make it make you want to cry. We look here in verse 4 and we're like, Nehemiah, is that the most like productive thing that you could do? Come on, rub some dirt on it. Grin and bear it. Let's get after it. There's work to do. But I think God rewards this. I think this is evidence right here that God is work at work in Nehemiah's heart. It says, as soon as I saw these, I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and I mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at the way that Nehemiah prayed. We're going to spend a lot of time focusing in on what he prayed, how he prayed, how often he prayed. But what we see in these first few verses is that it began with a burden, and we can see that Nehemiah is clearly brokenhearted. He's clearly concerned for the people in uh, Jerusalem. And it's so easy. Listen, how many of you guys know this? It's so easy to get numb to tragedy. I don't know that anybody knows that as well as you guys do. In 2019, how many school shootings have you heard about on the news? In 2019, how many... How many times have you heard about a friend that wanted to take their life or maybe even succeeded in taking their life? How many times have you heard this child went missing or, or this person was attacked or this person was, this, per, this group of people was assaulted? It's easy to get numb to the tragedy. It's easy to think, well, this stuff going on in Gainesville, it's not as big of a deal. It's not as... I mean, there's worse issues that are going on, right? I've been asking God, I've been begging God, I'm begging God on behalf of you to break our hearts freshly because we can get so calloused, we can get so numb, and we can be like, yeah, it happened again. Big deal. How many of you guys have seen this, this social media post? You can th go ahead and throw that up there. Uh, saw this like a week ago, a week or two ago. The Amazon has been burning for weeks and I'm just now finding out about it because of the lack of media coverage. This went viral. Raise your, but by round of, a, uh, round of applause, show of hands, whatever. Uh, by show of hands, how many of you guys have seen this? Some of you guys in the room, maybe you shared it, uh, and there's nothing wrong. I'm not, I'm not about to trash it. I'm not about to say, hey, you're wrong for sharing it. Nothing along those lines. Um, I loved seeing this. I didn't know anything about this. Now, they are coming out with some other reports, and they're saying, hey, well, hey, it, it actually, the Amazon burns every year, right? Have you seen this? It actually burns every year, and yeah, this part is burning really bad, but other parts are not, and it's kind of a so-so year. It's not quite as bad as maybe people thought it was at the beginning. Not the point. What I loved was people thousands of miles away all rallying around this saying, hey, we got to do something about this. This is bad. This is awful. This is the Amazon. We get a lot of oxygen, and there's the animals, and there's this, and there's that. And, and I'm not like saying, hey, you need, to, you need to grab every single social justice warrior issue and run with it. Uh, and I'm not saying you don't need to. All that struck me about this was people are burdened. People care. This is beautiful. This is great. Fantastic. I think, I think sometimes we can get numb to it. We can be like, yeah, there was a tsunami over there. Listen, I'm not going to lie. I'm a, I feel terrible saying this out loud. But a few years ago, there was a, there was a tsunami in Southeast Asia, and, and I, I probably thought about it for an hour or two. I thought, yeah, there was another tsunami. There was another earthquake. Oh, that's terrible. That's so awful. But an hour later, I wasn't thinking about it. Not that long ago, there was a shooting in El Paso, Texas, and I thought, that's terrible. No. How could this? And it, and it got political, and maybe that's part of the reason I didn't want to think about it as much, but I, was, I probably spent... Maybe an hour thinking about that. Somebody lost their life. And I hate that I've become so numb to it, that it's become so callous, that I'm so used to it. So I've been praying, God, break my heart for what breaks your heart. I've been praying for you, God, break these students' hearts for what breaks your heart. I didn't know how to wrap this up. I didn't know how to, like, communicate this. And I was... Looking at my computer yesterday, thinking, I don't, I don't know what to, to, to say. I don't know how to communicate this. I don't know how to make this real. And yesterday afternoon, I got a, a phone call. I got a phone call from a parent 
of a student who was involved here in this ministry. They were very, very involved here almost every week. And I'm not going to tell you the name of the person or their age or anything along those lines, but I got a phone call to say, hey, this person tried to take their life yesterday. Unsuccessfully. They're alive and they're in counseling and we are trying to do everything that we can to encourage them and love on them and get them the counsel that they need. But I'm sitting here asking God, break my heart, make this real for me, help me understand what you feel when you look at Buholtz High School and Middle School, uh, Fort Clark Middle School. I get this phone call that somebody who sat in this room got to a place where they were in so much pain, got to a place where they felt like nobody could relate, like nobody would understand and no one would even miss them if they just decided to end it all. And the terrifying thing is nobody could have guessed it. Nobody would have guessed, last time I, I talked to them or last time I saw them, nothing looked out of place. Nothing looked wrong whatsoever. They looked perfectly fine. They looked happy and everything was fine. And maybe you're here tonight and you've struggled with depression. Maybe you've even thought about that yourself. And I just want you to know, talk to somebody. We love you and we, 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 it breaks our heart to hear something about this. I started looking a little bit closer. I started looking just a little bit closer and here's what I found. When I looked online in Alachua County, in our county, not some far off, distant, displaced, generalized school or nationwide statistics, in Alachua County, in an average school of 2,000, in an average school of 2,000, 152 people walked into class this morning having made a suicide attempt in the last year. That's more than one in 20. That's heartbreaking. So I'm asking God, God, break our hearts for what breaks yours. God, give us a fresh vision. Give us a fresh idea of where you want us to move. Lord, help us see the lostness in our city. Don't let us just get used to doing this the, the same way that we've done it and the way that we've always been after it. And don't let us get callous, God. And then I find out this information, and it breaks my heart. And some of you guys are, 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 are catching where I'm going with this already. Clint's going to come and play for us, and we're going to have a time of invitation. But when I read right here, Nehemiah weeping, and he's saying, God, my city is on fire. When I see these social media posts, everybody, you got to pay attention. Everybody, you got to take notice. The Amazon is burning. I'm asking God, I'm asking God, help our students understand, give, help me understand, and help us come to you crying and begging and pleading and say, God, my school is on fire. God, my city is in flames. God, there's so many people in this room who don't know you. Lord, reach out to them. Help them understand your gospel. Send your Holy Spirit to help them understand, intervene for them. Listen, I said at the beginning of the room of, of the, the, the talk tonight, I said there's a lot of people, you might be here for the first time, maybe you've been here ten times. Either way, I believe you have an appointment with eternity. I don't believe it's a surprise that you're here. I don't believe it's an accident. I believe God made an appointment for you, and it's today. And so there's an opportunity for all of us to respond tonight. There's a place for all of us to answer. There's a place for all of us to hear from God. But my first invitation is this. If you are here in the room tonight, and there's ever been a point in time in your life where you felt like no one cared, no one would notice if you were gone, it's not even worth it, the pain is too much, I want you to know that there is a loving God who sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for you. He loved you so much, he thought you were worth dying for. He doesn't want you to take your life. He's greater than your depression. He's greater than that feeling of loneliness. He's greater than that feeling of emptiness. And he 
He's got people sitting all around you that are broken hearted and burdened that you would come to the saving knowledge of his son Jesus. I want you to have an opportunity to respond tonight. To the rest of us in the room, maybe you've been a believer a long, long time. Maybe you are in a situation where you're thinking, I've, I've, I know the church scene. I know what it's about. Please ask God to break your heart. I can't do it for you. I can't preach a better sermon. We can't play better music. We can't do some games to make you get excited or passionate about following the Lord. But what I am begging God to do is to pierce your heart, to give you a fresh conviction, to give you a righteous indignation at the state of your school, at the fact that there are 152 people in your school who think it is not worth living that there are hundreds and hundreds more who don't know the life-saving news of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so maybe you're here tonight and you're just thinking, I've, I've done the church game. I'm asking you to ask God to break your